Hi, everybody. This is Kathy L. <laughs> Murphy, the Pulp Wood Queen. I am in East Texas at my little cabin in the woods at Holly Lake Ranch, surrounded by my books. And I am so excited, you all, because we have New York Times best selling author, <laughs> Carolyn Levitt, here with her tiara on, surrounded yes. by her books <laughs> in her home. And you're in Boston, right? Or just. No, no, I'm just outside New York City. I'm in Hoboken, outside New York actually. City. Okay. Hoboken. Well, the amazing things that we can do with these Zoom meetings and go from during this time of you know social distancing it's been crazy but i'm here you all because i'm in love with carolyn's books i have been <laughs> selecting her book for over a decade in fact she won i think nearly 10 years ago for pictures of you oh my gosh you got your <laughs> I got it. This was for Cruel Beautiful World. It was the Pulpwood Queen's Book of the Year. And isn't this beautiful? It's, it's, yeah, it's and so perfect. Harder it's just harder perfect. to find those. So hang on to it. So oh, I do. I treasure it. Well, I love this book because, um, you know, I have a lot of musicians in my life. In fact, my ex husband uh, is a that's musician. That's right. That's right. So, um, you know, I could totally relate to this. And I hope you saw my crazy video I did on your book where I dressed up as a rock star. And my daughter said, <laughs> Mom, Mom, were you trying to channel Kiss? And I go, No, I was not. I was just trying to be hip. And they go, you don't need to do that. You don't need to do that anymore. But the crazy things I do for my authors and their books is because I believe in them so much. And when I pick an author such as Caroline, who is with one of my favorite publishers of all time, Algonquin out of Chapel Hill, and uh, I love their books. I used to actually be a book rep for Algonquin. That's right. I uh, was with Workman Publishing as... Um, a book publisher's rep with Southern Territories. So I have a long history with the wonderful books that they pick. And I love it that you've been with them from the very beginning. And we kind of been together with you too. So I'm going to shut up and I'm going to let you just tell us the story. How did this book come about? Uh-oh. Before I tell the, okay. Go ahead. Before I tell this story, I want to talk about the Pulpwood Queens and uh -huh. you and what you've done. The uh -huh. Pulpwood Queens is this amazing organization. They have hundreds and hundreds of book clubs across the country. And every year they get together for a three-day fest called the Girlfriend's Weekend, even though there are also guys from the um, uh, Timberland right? Timber, timber, timber guys, timber guys, timber guys. Okay. So they all get together and every year there is a theme and I've gone for two years and it is wild. There's anywhere from 500 to 800 people there. There are all these book clubs from all over The the people are wonderful. Some one year, all the women decorated their tables. It was hilarious. You dress up in costume. The first year uh, it was circus theme. And the second year when I came was, um, I forget, we had, oh, Pat Conroy, and we all were there in khaki pants and <laughs> baseball caps. And it's just, it's just talks and dancing and parties and wonderful. And I also want to say, Kathy, you were the greatest supporter of writers everywhere, anywhere. You're going to make everywhere. me cry. I've had No, it's day. true. So thank you. Thank you so much. You have a heart as big as Texas, bigger than Texas. Oh, you're just so amazing. I okay. just adore you. Yeah. I adore you too. And I adore all the public queens. Um, you know, once you make a friend there, they're friends for life. That's true. It's absolutely it's true. true. We're a very supportive book club. And that's why it's so important that during this time of social distancing, that we keep everything going. Little did we know yeah. when we had our 20th anniversary that, and we started the Pulpwood Academy, which is our online book club, that we would need it more than ever. So I have... Oh, yeah. I have worked all my life 24 seven on this, but I've never worked harder than during this time of social distancing, because as people are dropping off because they go, why do I want to be in the book club? We can't meet. They don't even realize that I've created all these programs like Breathless Bubbles and Books. 
And I, I actually have gotten out a bottle of the bubbly. I wish I could share it with you. I wish I could mail it to you, but I can't. Nobody, no, nobody's mailing anything. I am breathless over your book. And, I wanna, and I've asked all my Breathless and Bubbles and Books um, fans and, and Facebook group to join us today because uh, you're a New York Times bestselling author. You know, I try to pick authors that are first time, first book. And I invest in them the way they used to in publishing, where right. you pick a book, then you, you're a Pulp and Queen author forever, as far as I'm concerned. Right. right. And you're always, anytime you want to come back and join our party, we're not going to have another Girlfriend Weekend until 2022. But we <laughs> are going to have a Zoomathon in January. <gasps> Excellent, excellent. So I want to be part of that. Be a pick with your book. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, when I announce the books, all the books, December 1st for 2021, I'm going to put out uh, to all my authors a sign-up sheet for when you'd like to be featured. And we're on the hour, we're going to get everybody in. Every hour, I'm going to drink tons of coffee. And we're going to post an <laughs> author, every author, a panel of authors. Wonderful. So I would love to have you on board. But we're going to oh. be working together with the Mighty Blaze coming up, too. So I want you first to tell us how this book came about. Because okay. it's a very interesting story. Okay, um, With or Without You is really about, well, it's about a lot of things. Primarily, it's about a lot what happens to a long time couple when one of them really dramatically changes, which I think is something everyone can relate to. If you're with somebody for 20 years, they become a different person. And if you don't become a different person with them, chances are you won't, you know, you won't stay together. So I have Simon, who was a one time famous rock star in his 20s, and now he's in his 40s. And he's starting to be more on the side of dad rock and roll than current. And he's desperate for that fame again. His longtime partner is Stella, who wants him to grow the hell up and buy their apartment and, you know, do something else. And they're arguing and they're drinking and there's a drug involved. And in the morning, he wakes up and she doesn't. And she's in a coma, and when she wakes up, her personality is dramatically changed. And she has this uh, very special talent that gives her the fame that her partner, Simon, is still really, really jealous about. And the book is really about how they, how they each handle that. And it also involves her best friend and how her best friend handles it. And I did a lot of research on comas. Um, I actually was in a coma myself, but a very different sort of one than Stella. When I had my son, who is 24 now, I contracted this really rare blood disease. And nobody at the hospital knew what was wrong with me. They just knew that I was bleeding everywhere. And they, were, they really expected me to die. So they put me in a three week, three and a half week coma. And I was in the hospital for three months while they were trying to figure it out. And meanwhile, they gave me this thing called memory blockers. I mean, who knew there was such a thing as memory blockers? But so I don't remember any of it. But the weird thing about that was that even though I don't remember any of it, the people who do remember it, my husband, my friends, my mom, my sister, who lived through it, they were so traumatized, they didn't want to talk about it when I asked them. So, and the doctors, when I talked to the doctors, the doctors were such windbags, <laughs> excuse me, doctors. <laughs> they kept saying, oh, I'm the one who saved your life. I'm the one who saved your life. So I didn't really get a sense of like, well, what was it like for me? So while my mind didn't have any sense of that, my body did. And when I finally got out of the hospital and I was able to move around, I had triggers. If I saw somebody with a brown and yellow and white striped shirt, I would have a panic attack. Those were the hospital curtains. Those were the hospital oh curtains. Oh my gosh, you know, I get it. I get yeah. what the, you know, your book. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I, I um, like all these things. So I, so I went to a psychologist who said, well, you know, you're a writer. Maybe you should write about it. But I didn't want to write about somebody who was like me, who didn't remember it. I thought it would be better if I wrote about somebody who was the opposite. So I created Stella, who remembers everything. She remembers everything in the coma, everything afterwards. And I also gave her a special talent 
which I did not have <laughs> when, I, when I emerged. I, I did a lot of research with this guy, Joseph Clark, who's at the University of Cincinnati, and he does coma research. And he was the one who told me that when you're in a coma, your brain is firing and rewiring, and you actually can become a different person. And there are cases of people who wake up from coma and suddenly they're a virtuoso on the violin and they never played before. Or suddenly they can, they can sing when they never could sing before and they went on to have a career in Broadway. And they don't really understand why this happens, except it does happen. And as soon as I heard that, I thought, oh, this book is going to be really fun. And it was. It was. That's wild. You know, I, when I first read it, I thought about Barbara Mandrell because she was in that um, accident, car accident, and she had traumatic brain injury, oh, boy. I think, coma. But she came, when she came out of it, she was a totally different person. She didn't know who anybody was. And, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine, but I have known a lot of people that husbands have had or family members have had brain injury and they say they come back changed. And yep. so it's fascinating. It's and just fascinating. another reason why I love your books because you, you hit on topics that haven't really been discussed before. So, you know, Thank you. I, want, I want books that stories I haven't heard. <laughs> I mean, right. I have every queen book sent to me in the world, but you know, it's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of been done y'all. So I love your books and Thank I you. love the, it was so real and authentic and you could really tell you did your research. Yeah, absolutely. So, Thank you. Yeah. And uh, so this book comes out and I'm looking every day. You're like screaming because you got this review, that <laughs> review, no. People Magazine. I'm just going, what do you think happened this year? Because, I mean, this is the most I've ever seen your book get attention. Yes, but you're right. You're what right. What happened right. this it's... year? Do you think that that connected so much with so many people? I don't know. I mean, I think maybe it's the whole thing of, like, where with the pandemic, everything is suddenly different. You know, and we're looking at that because life has, like, just turned on. And when I was writing the book, you know, everything was fine and it just sort of struck a nerve with people i think that we're all different and also a lot of couples you know when they're stuck together in a pandemic all of a sudden they look at each other and realize i don't know you or i don't i don't really want to know you or be with you anymore and i think that's you know i think that's the thing that came up it's true and i, I know and i had no have idea no. yeah so. whoops i'm double oh hi hi <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Hello. We now see you on the screen. Welcome to our chat. We're just thrilled that you're here with us. And and for those that um, you know don't get on, this will be recorded and put on my Kathy L. Murphy YouTube channel so that if people miss it, they they're not going to miss this because I'm going to be sharing it with the world, Carolyn. But uh, what I love too about you is you 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 juggle many balls. You know, we're like when yeah. I had the circus theme, it was because I was uh, juggling the Pulpwood Queen's family, my beauty shop, you know, all right. my civic activities. But right. you're now writing for uh, a magazine and you're doing book reviews and you're doing all this other thing. And I have to tell you that please keep every one of your features coming because you are touching on issues that are so important and I know they're going to help so many people they've helped me okay i'm so they've glad. already helped me so much i love your honesty and it's out of your comfort zone i know but it's time don't you think it's time i, I think it's time right yeah I, abs I absolutely agree with you. And it's funny because when I first started writing, I was really, really shy and I wouldn't really talk about myself because I was afraid and my upbringing and all this other stuff. And then one day I had to give a talk and by mistake, it was a, I thought it was a mistake. By mistake, I started talking about how I was bullied as a child and how mortified I was that I had asthma. And to my surprise, I looked up at the audience and they liked it. <laughs> 
<laughs> I mean, people came up to me afterwards and said, thank you so much for saying that. I went through the same thing. And I said, well, I, you know, I wish you had raised your hand and we could have talked about it more. And they said, no, 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 no. I can't talk about anybody over this. And I started to think, wow, you know what? Writers are like, we're like the canaries in the coal mine where you have to tell the truth. And to often tell, if you tell your deepest truth, it becomes the deepest truth for somebody else. And writing is the way I understand things. I mean, it took me a really, really long time to write about my sister because I felt I have to protect her, I have to protect myself. And then I realized that writing was so freeing, you know, just to get this out. And I thought, well, you know, maybe it'll help other people. And I think it has, because I've been getting a lot of response from those things. And now I feel like, you know what, we have such a short time on this earth that why not tell the truth, tell your truth, and don't be ashamed of anything, and like, you know, screw being ashamed, and being shy, and all that, just be who you are, and tell your truth, and see how, see if it helps others. Well, by reading your stories, and your books, it helped me to become a little bit more brave about speaking out on things that, you know, I never in a million years would ever said anything before because you're totally was, brave. What are you talking about? I'm really curious oh, no, now. You were no, the no. bravest I woman I know. A brave face, but wow, uh, it it was authors. Um, you know, when I was writing my memoir, my story, uh, oh, it was so hard. And I remember talking to Jeanette Walls, who wrote the memoir of the Glass Castle, and right. and I said, I'm going to guess that you didn't put that maybe small percentage of what really happened she goes how did you know and I go because I know I've I've been there and and when Pat Conroy I called him because my mother tried to stop my book she called the publisher I didn't know and that oh, oh my yeah. god it was very traumatic for me because by her doing that you know my publisher which was one of the big five had to do a legal vetting and uh <sighs> And, and the things that I thought that she would be upset about, because I immediately called her and said, why are you doing that? And she goes, well, you know, you got a lot of money for that book. And she goes, and I didn't get anything. And you're talking about me. And you mentioned that I was raised in the country. And I don't want anybody in New York to know that. And I go, why? Oh, well, you know, mother, people of your generation, most of them were raised in small town. Rural. Right. You know, it's only been in the last years that majority of kids being born are born in cities and she goes well I just don't want anybody to know that and um, she also told me that um, I didn't mention that her best friend was the president of the university in my hometown I didn't oh. know that I, I said I didn't know that he was your best friend and she goes well you didn't even put it in the book and you mentioned the university and you didn't say anything about Jill Baker being my best friend <laughs> and so okay. I was able to change my book to get that in there, but it never did. It, it really had nothing to do with the book. It had more to do with, um, you know, our relationship in general, because um, it has, it's not ever been a good one. But, uh, you know, you move on and you move on by reading mm -hmm. your stories, by reading your articles. And it's, uh, the more I read these stories, the more I become brave. And if you, oh, here we got Susan Peterson's joining us from Sue's Reading Neighborhood. Hi, Susan. Hi, Susan. <laughs> welcome, welcome. We're just getting Hi, started. Yay, I'm so glad <laughs> to have you guys here. But if any of you have any questions, we'll <laughs> open them up at the very end. But thank God for what you're doing and um, you know, everybody thinks that when you run a book club, you're an extrovert, but I'm just, I was that kid with my nose stuck in the book, uh, you know, when I'm, you know, and I've become brave by reading my author's stories, you mm -hmm. know, so, and, and also if you're really passionate about what you're in love with, you forget your fear, right, Susan? Right. That's right. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you are really passionate about, I mean, this poor girl, she, you know, runs one of the big blogs in Texas. Um, I got her to do a panel at Girlfriend Weekend this year. And I said, as we're going up on stage, oh, by the way, I'm going to give you a big hair makeover while you lead the panel. Oh! <laughs> it was so much fun. We had a blast. And I'm just doing her hair. And she's just, 
you were just so cool. You just <laughs> just kept interviewing all the authors. I, as I had no idea what was going on. Everybody, was, it was the highlight of Girls it was Weekend. Fun. That is, that's the thing about the pulpwood is that you go there and everybody's dressed up and everybody's like, I remember I came down with three wigs and you start to realize that anything you were ever like shy about or afraid about, you know, leave it at the door, leave it at the door because it becomes incredibly fun. And I wanted to say that I also, I really loved your book, Kathy. I thought it was really brave. And I think I see you as you're like, you know, one of my spirit animals and that I always look <laughs> at all the stuff you do where you're always doing new things and you're always recreating yourself. And I think that's something that really resonates with people now. Hey, I'm just trying to survive. I have no job right now. You know, um, I have, you know, took this position as director of acquisitions for Lizard right. House, but we can't, we're, we can't put any books out until this is really over because right. we're right. seeing all of our friends and our books just die on the vine, you right. know? Um, so we're waiting on that. I can't do hair because the shop I worked in. Yeah, you can't touch anybody. Right. Right. It closed. So I'm out of that. And so the Pulpa Queens is pretty much it for me. So thank you for all of your amazing support, Carolyn, because you've really you know, saved me. And for all of you that let me post my posts and uh, for this um, man that here is with us, we do have lots of men joining <laughs> us. They're called Timber Guys. Timber and Guys. They're just <laughs> like you. Are you Jim or what's your first name? What's his name is his name is Jeff, I believe. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff Lyons. Okay, Jeff. I just saw Jay Lyons, but anyway, uh, they're always <laughs> reticent about coming to something called Girlfriend Weekend. But let me tell you, we have more guys coming this year. My co-host is Revis Wortham, who is a New York Times best-selling suspense thriller writer. He's bringing in um, um, Jeffrey Deaver and. John Kilstrap and some wow. of the guys that he runs with. So we've got some pretty major uh, guys coming in this year. And actually, I got more blurbs on my book from men than I did from women. The publisher picked that pink cover, okay? <laughs> Because I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have picked it. I, I look crazy on that original cover. So please don't let that scare you away. It's not like you're coming into a beauty shop or anything. But uh, anyway, uh, Carolyn. So you have. Tell us about how you got started with this Mighty Blaze because oh, I'm okay. really excited about this initiative because it's pretty powerful. Okay. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I've always, my parents used to demean me by saying I was the Pollyanna of the family when I was growing up. But when March, when the pandemic started, I was just about to be flown to Texas, actually, to speak in front of the Texas Library Association. And all of a sudden it was canceled. Oh, wow. And I said to my publicist, well, the other, I have other stuff coming up. And they said, look, it's going to all be canceled. And I remember walking around my house saying, nothing is going to be canceled. I, what can I do? And I, I had done a speech for the library. So I thought, well, you know what, I'm going to video it and send it to my publisher just, you know, to tell them, look, this is what I was going to do. So I did the whole speech with hand motions and everything. And I sent it to them. And they said, we're going to send it to all the libraries and they sent it to all the libraries so then i thought i can do this for other authors so i just put up on facebook facebook look i know all of you are freaking out but i'm starting the nothing is canceled book tour and what it is, is that i'm going to make little videos of you and you just talk about your book for a fifth you know, a few minutes like what it is and the only requirement for me to post about you is you have to shout out another author whose book is coming out now. And you have to shout out an indie bookstore. And I thought I was going to get like 10 people. And all of a sudden oh, I got no. 200. And I was starting to work like 20 hours a day. And then the Washington Post called me. And I was saying to um, Jeff, my husband, how am I going to do this? And then I got a call from Jenna Blum. And Jenna Blum is also a New York Times bestselling wow. author. And she said, Caroline, do, would you like some help? I said, oh my God, yes. Oh my God. So we got together and now Jenna, Jenna is like, she's like an Oprah where she should have her own TV show. She's so smart. Yeah. And she's, yeah, she's like full of energy and she loves strategizing and producing and doing this. Um, so we formed a Mighty Blaze and 
again, we thought we would have like five people. Instantly, we had like 200 people. The Authors Guild came to us wanting to partner. We had John Irving and Gail Godwin and Elizabeth Stroud and, and, you know, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, all these places wanted to talk to us. And, you know, we developed a little logo for ourselves. And we were all working, we were both working like 20 hours a day to get this thing out and to help people. And first it was just going to be, we're just going to promote books published on Tuesday, on Tuesdays. And then it became, well, we're also going to interview big people like John Irving on Friday. I watched that one. Uh, yeah, there's a story with that with John Irving. Um, and we just got bigger and bigger and bigger. We now have 20 volunteers. Um, they're starting to monetize. Um, they're running book festivals. They've got merchandise. They've got everything. The interesting thing about A Mighty Blaze is that Gemma is really the, she's really the driving force. She runs all the book festivals. She does everything. What I do, what I'm good at is, I can get the writers. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sort of, I can get the writers. They they either all know me or they like me or the way I ask them moves them enough to say, okay, we'll do it. So that's really what I'm doing for the Blaze now. But with somebody like John Irving, that that took me so long to do. I mean, he's my literary hero. And I had actually emailed his publicist who I know as a book critic, to ask if John would consider Blurry one of my books like five years ago. And she said, let me ask him. And she came back and she said, John knows who you are, which made me go, <laughs> he knows who you are, but he's not Blurry books. And I said, okay, that's fine. You know, I, I get it. I get it. So when A Mighty Blaze came about, I went back to the post and I said, look, this is what we're doing. We have the Authors Guild. We've been written up here and here and here. I would love to interview John. Would he consider it? And it literally took about a month of going back and forth through his assistant, who's wonderful. And the assistant would say, well, John wants to know if he can see the questions beforehand. And I say, absolutely. And then it was, John wants to know if he can see his bio. Absolutely. And every single so I sent them all the questions and they came back with John's comments about, no, I don't want to do that. Or yes, I want to do that. And I would like you to ask me this. And then it was all set up. And the day of the interview, I was so terrified because, you know, I was like meeting my hero. But he turned out to be the kindest, nicest, most generous person on the planet. And the interview was so great. Um, and he was so great. Um, and it was, it was a huge moment for me. And the thing about The Blaze is that I get to, I get to interview these authors that... I've never had access to and it's 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 thrilling it's absolutely thrilling oh look at you you're one of them now <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that <laughs> that's very sweet of you to say but um I, I don't really think that way I mean part of in with or without you a lot of it is about fame you know Simon who was once famous and then he lost it and he yearns for it again when I published my first novel, I was in my 20s, and my first novel was like instant fame. It was like they took a short story of mine, and they wanted it to be a novel, and every, there was all this publicity, and I thought, wow, this is cool. This is going to happen all the time, and of course, it didn't. I mean, you know, I, my publishers dropped me. I was bouncing around. I had five different publishers before I went to Algonquin, and in fact, before I got to Algonquin, yep, I did, and they never, and big ones too, big five ones. They just, they never promoted the books and you know who knows so the books got like two reviews and then they died um so i was actually writing pictures of you on contract for another publisher whose name i won't say and they called me up after and they said you know caroline we don't really think this book is special enough for our list and i said what and they said no one here really likes it and i said Oh, well, can I said, well, you know, I can rewrite it. And she said, we don't think you can. And I said, yeah. well, what if I, what if I show you something else? And again, there was this funny silence. And my editor said, you know, Caroline, we don't think that you can. So best of luck. Wow. Hope you find another publisher, blah, blah, blah. And I hung up the phone and I was hysterical. And I thought, what am I going to do? If you have nine novels and they've all been failures and they haven't made any money and nobody knew They're who I was. Failure. They're not failures. I'm, no, I'm, no, but that's that was my thinking. That was my thinking. They didn't sell. Let me just say they did not sell. They did not sell. They were not promoted. 
I just knew I wasn't going to get another publisher. So my agent told me not to worry. And I cried to all my writer friends. And one of them said, I'm with this great publisher, Algonquin. Let me talk to my editor for you. And I said, okay. So she talked to the editor and the editor said, well, I'd like to see the manuscript. So I sent the manuscript and then the editor called me. And she was talking about the manuscript and blah, blah, blah. And I just said, oh, she's just being nice. And then all of a sudden the conversation switched and I realized she's pitching me Algonquin. So I stopped her because I'm an honest person. And I said, you do know that I don't, I don't sell books. And she laughed and she said, oh, honey, you will now. <laughs> and they bought the book for a really modest sum. And six weeks before it went out, it was in seven printings. The second wow. week it was out. I hope, I hope America is listening to this. Oh yeah, you never give up. You never give up. You never give up. And you know, don't let somebody else define. No, don't let anybody else define you. Second week it was out. It was a New York Times bestseller. All of a sudden it was like phone calls and emails and write-ups and this, that. And I was actually very glad that it had taken me that long to get there because when it happened again, I felt very very differently about what it means to be known. I just felt, well, this is really nice, but it's really nice because it allows me to write my next book. <laughs> you know, It allows me to feel better about myself and I can write my next book. But in terms of thinking like Simon did, like, oh, these people love me. I mean, I just felt like that's ephemeral. That's not important. And it also gave me a really important lesson, which is that no does not always mean no. No. Um, it's just one person's opinion. Never give up. No. Just keep persisting. And the funny thing was that, you know, after the book was out for a few months, it was doing really, really well. The editor called my agent and said, oh, would Caroline want to come back to us? And my agent said, no, <laughs> she's not changing publishers to come back to you. So I thought that was so interesting that, you know, the very woman who said that, you know, they didn't think I could ever write anything special, wanted me to come back. So if you're a writer, you know, I don't care if you have like 80 rejections, it doesn't mean anything because the 81st might be the person who really gets your book and brings you out to the public. And you should never, you know, you never can depend on what anybody else says. It's, it's just a lot of it is luck and timing. And I think the most thing is persistence. Just really persist and doing it for the love of it. Doing it for the and love of it. And honing your craft because you're honing you your keep craft. Getting better and better and better. And even when I think you can't. But I love this story. And it's exactly why I started my inclusive book club, you know, Great. because I had a book club invite me to join theirs and then they told me I couldn't. So, you know. Really? I, why? I, the story actually will be in my sequel oh, to in my next book. <laughs> will be in my book because I finally feel confident enough to tell what happened. And that's why I started the Pulpit Queens because the local book club invited me. And then when I said, oh, what are we reading next month? They said, uh, well, uh, we don't know really. I mean, the hostess pulled me out into the hallway of her home and she said, I don't really know how to tell you this, but we just invite you as a guest. We didn't invite you as a member. So, really? Well, screw that. Somebody dies or moves away. Oh, excuse me. And it's so funny because, you know, immediately when I started my book club, we got lots of national media attention. I mean, Good Morning America, you know, the Oprah show, everybody had us on. And um, then when, you know, Good Morning came out, I think the second time, they all started joining my book club and I never told them no because we're an inclusive book club. Right, and I right. keep having people tell me no. And I usually don't speak out about it, but I have decided that it's time to say, you know, stop the meanness, right. stop the hate, let's all work together. It's all about the importance of reading and mm -hmm. wonderful books like yourself. And so that's why when I partner with people like, you know, Susan from Sue's Reading Neighborhood and some of the other ones, are you still, the, can you guys still see me? Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know why y'all disappeared from my view. But uh -oh. here, oh. Where, where y'all went, you're, I don't know where you went. So let me see, it just disappeared, but I'll keep talking. But anyway, okay. um, 
I just want to say that I appreciate the support, Carolyn, that you've given me. And there's nothing I won't do for you. I mean, what you went through to get to Girlfriend Weekend that one year, still, <laughs> uh, you know, stay for a long time because my hands were tied. You were stuck in an airport with no way to get to the convention center. Tell, tell what happened. It's so funny now but it wasn't funny then right well it was sort of funny i mean i was you have to understand this airport was really tiny and there were only two people in there working and i was standing there with there was one other writer thank god who was also going to the pulp was and it was like one at night or something and the two people who were there were putting on their coats to leave and i said where are you going and they said oh we're going home but you can stay here we have the doors are going to stay open all night and you know i'm a new york city girl and i said you leave the doors open all night and we two women are just going to be there alone and she said yeah it'll be fine he said well That's do you crazy. have <laughs> I said, I, I said, is there a cab company or a limo company I can call? And she said, oh, they don't come here. And so my friend, the other woman said, well, I'm going to rent a car. And so she, she called Avis and we heard a, a phone ringing. It was in the airport. It was in the Avis Center, which was closed <laughs> down. <laughs> So I finally called a limo company and I said, please, will you come get me? And he said, no, we can't. And I said, well, well, I will give you name your price. And he said, well, it's going to take us an hour. And I said, that's okay. What do you want? And he said, he said, oh, I want $130. And I said, done, just come, just come. And we were afraid he wasn't going to show up, but he did show up. Oh and my God. Was just, you know, it was actually fun because there was another, it was Nicole Wagoner, actually. I remember her name and we became really good friends. Oh my oh God. God. Yeah. And it was, it was like, no, it's a really funny story now. At the time, I think I was just sort of, I was too dumbfounded to be scared because I thought, what are we going to do? And in the end, I thought, well, we'll just, we'll hide. If somebody comes in, <laughs> we'll hide in the bathrooms until they leave. And then when it's light out, we'll be okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my God. That's crazy. That's just crazy. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. I can hear you and can okay, see you perfectly. Well, I, I can't get you guys back on screen. So just keep talking. Can you okay. even see? Yeah, we can see you perfectly. Yeah, this is so yeah. weird. Okay, I've never had this happen before, but I'm I'm learning the technology. So, just keep talking. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I'm definitely going to blurb your book, your next book, Kathy. So oh, don't have to worry about you're that. A sweetheart. No, nope, don't worry about that. We will have you on. Um, so um, I don't know what to talk about. <laughs> well, I, let me oh, say. I, oh yes, Carol, please, Susan, I, speak. Yeah, please. I read your book, Caroline. <laughs> And I love thank your you book. so much thank the you new so book. much and I, I know I tweeted you about it and, and stuff but it was so good thank it was, you so the much. concept was interesting and unique and the characters were I loved how they changed and grew it was just it was wonderful it, okay. it's it's so funny because writing this book was so so hard i had a uh, my editor at algonquin who had edited my first three books left to go to another publisher and she wanted me to come with her and i was i'm really loyal and i just i just couldn't leave algonquin because they had given me my career so i stayed and i got a new editor and i was really really nervous because i didn't know how to work with mm -hmm. him and he had a different sensibility and i remember there was one point like my, where I was sitting in this office with the pages all around me crying, thinking, this book is terrible. It's boring. It's like nothing's happening in it. And I was actually going to call them and give them the advance back <laughs> because I couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, and I just sat down and I tried to like do structural, structural work with it to get it to work. And I had no idea if it was gonna work. Plus it came out in a pandemic, which just shows you that you never know, you know, you never know. But once something you is never, out there, all you can do is help, you know, help. You never know. Yeah, you never know. So, wow, that's crazy. Who is your editor? Is it somebody new or? Chuck, it is, it's Chuck Adams. Um, okay, he edited I like, did, but I did not know he was an editor there. So yep, he he edited like Water for Chocolate, uh, not like yep. Water for Chocolate, a, a, a Water for Elephants, Water for Elephants. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He's um he's um and we've and he's he bought my next book which I'm writing now, so um ah. so it's you know I'm still with El Guy. 
I didn't want to leave Algonquin and now I have a new editor and, and he's promised to, he's going to be retiring soon, unfortunately, but he's promised to edit this next book and I'm sure they will, you know, all the editors of Algonquin are great. So, but oh, it's funny yeah, because cool. you, I guess my point was just, you really never know. You reach a point where you've done the best you can do and then you have to let it go and start to work on something else, which is what I did. But, um, I'm totally surprised by the reception. I just thought, <laughs> really? <laughs> but, well, I, um, you know, I'm, I, I wasn't surprised, but I, it did seem over the top this year. And Yeah, I, I, and I don't know why. I, I, again, I think it's because of the pandemic stuff where people were thinking about big changes all of a sudden, which was the pandemic. I mean, one moment you're walking around the city and there's zillions of people, and the next moment everything's closed. And oh. I don't know if all of you remember it, but when the pandemic started, there were no restaurants open, not even oh, for takeout at first. It was just, you could go to the pharmacy, you could go to the grocery store, and that's it. That's and all you can do here. That's all you can do here is go to the pharmacy and the grocery store and the post office. That's it. There's yeah. nothing else. Still. There's nothing else. And yeah. then it's the, the new normal is, you know, you walk around and everybody's in masks and it's, it's a whole, I think that was the thing. I think that people didn't necessarily want to read about, you know, dystopian societies right now while we're in one, <laughs> but they could get close to thinking about that with a book about what happens when everything changes. Yeah. You know, like, what do you do? This How do you handle it? Great, uh, I, I see a lot of books that are going to use this as a, a, a storyline and I kind of like what happened when the hurricanes hit down in New Orleans a lot of books came out in fact I had a whole chapter about what happened um, you know because that hurricane uh, Katrina hit during my birthday and <gasps> oh uh, no it was and all these people I lived a long way from New Orleans but our town which is was I lived in Jefferson was historical and all these people flooded into town and filled up every bed and breakfast and everything <sighs> and then the weekend came and they had to get out because there were other bookings and there was no place to put these people. So I wrote about what we did. We put them up in our churches. I did story times on the front porch. I put sandwiches in coolers that public queens would drop by for people because their credit cards got maxed out and then they were broke and they were stuck in a town with no place to stay, no <sighs> money, no access to banks, their homes were underwater. And, you know, it was devastating. So on my birthday the next year, I went back because I wanted to see. And, you know, over somewhere between 100 and 200 bodies are still in a building there, um, refrigerated, because they can't figure out who they are. Oh, my God. And my, my brother-in-law spent a year down there working for insurance adjusters, going out and inventorying these businesses. And he tells, he told, I said, you've got to write a book, Richard, because every day he passed a dead man on the street, the same one, but he never got picked up. And he was just on the street for a month and he never got picked up. And every day it was worse and worse. And, you know, that's why we are human because we share our stories and once we share our stories we can have empathy and understanding mm -hmm. right. and just like you're sharing the story about this young woman who goes into this coma i mean my gosh i can't even imagine uh what that would be like for you or for that person you know but i try to put myself in those shoes but um i'm really anxious can you tell us anything about your next book <laughs> no <laughs> I, I can't because I'm still figuring out the structure of it. You know, I'm well, sort of I like, I have, I have until um, next October to turn it in. And in the meantime, I'm still like, I'm sort of feeling my way. And I don't, I don't really know. I don't really know. All I know is that. I'm not, so I'm not one of those interviewers where I go, you need to tell, you know, I'm sorry. It's <laughs> I can't. It's like it's too ten. It's too tender. It's like at the stage now where I'm not really talking to anybody about it or showing anybody about it. Well, you can't blame me for trying because I love. I your know. Book. I know. <laughs> you know. I am. I'm of the belief that 
I'd rather wait for the great book than have people churning them out as fast as they can, because I think sometimes some books come easy and some don't, you know, it's right. just, I'm working on three all at the same time. And I've been working on one for decades and I don't know if I'll ever get it done, but I will, I will eventually. But uh, Susan, is there anything you want to ask for your, to share? Because you can share this with your Sue's reading neighborhood and, and want to get you on the call so you can jump in. Anything you want to was was the coma part was any of that like from something that happened to you or that happened to somebody that you know she the coma the, the coma the person falling and going into the coma and what they experienced oh it was it was well her experience was totally different than mine but i was in a coma for three and a half weeks and wow. well i don't remember it because I, I had memory blockers but i did a whole lot of research oh. on it i did not talk to oddly enough i did not talk to other people who had been in coma who came out and i did that deliberately because i didn't want to you know, I didn't want to take their stories. I wanted to yeah. sort of riff off their stories. Also, I have a confession. Um, Jay Lyons is actually a friend of mine. <laughs> it's, oh. it's Jeff Lyons. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's, a, he's a story structure guru. And actually, um, Jeff helps me with all of my stories as I structure them. So he's actually probably the only one who does know something about my new novel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And he's not going to tell. Cool. He's also a no. He better not tell. And he's also a writer himself. So, well, what will we do without these um, individuals that support us? I mean, good for We'd you. We'd be Jeff. lost. We'd be lost. We'd be it's lost. And I, I, you know, I had somebody say to me, uh, you know, Kathy, what you're doing is so important. And I said, you know, for me, it's kind of just book saved me so i'm just trying to show the world that if you don't can't figure out your life read because it's like the poor man's psychiatrist couch i had a, a recently an author say to me so who do you go for therapy and i said my books <laughs> I go to my books. I couldn't right. have ever afforded a therapist if I wanted to, but um, I think therapy is important. And for me, it's reading because I figure right. things out after right. I read it. And I, I read so much of um, the relationship story. I really related a lot to what was going on between this couple in the book. And so it helped me figure some things out. And uh, I do, I do that with every book when you, a book right. to bring our own experiences into the read. So um, anyway, I'm, I'm just so very proud of you. I'm just, I'm so happy to be on here and I just, you know, anything for you, Kathy. Well, and I'll tell you that's, that kind of takes me away because so many times authors when they make the new york times bestseller i never hear from them again you know i invite them oh, back that's ridiculous and, that's ridiculous you know, no. they just say, oh, i'm sorry I, i'm only be going to los angeles and chicago and i go you know I, and I will tell the publishing world and the reading world that if you want to have a lot of bestseller done you need to look to the small towns the small that's right that's right these Groups of women, mostly women, we do have some men, but these groups of women, when they get behind a book, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. Book of the year, and it was pretty much unanimous. I mean, there were a few people that, you know, spoke out for this their again. Love. This again but, is my beautiful book of the year award. It's a globe, and it's just gorgeous. It's really. Well, we're an international book club. You, we we owe you the world. You've got the whole world <laughs> in your hands, you know. It's, I love it's, this. Yeah, I, I do too, because like you need one more chachi thing to put on your desk. No, this is beautiful. This is absolutely beautiful. I literally gasped when I saw it. Um, and if you remember, I caught my ring in your hair. As <laughs> hey, it's easy to catch in this big, you know. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> well, it was for a screen and girlfriend weekend. As you can see, it's faded. And, uh, you know, I have to do my, I cut my hair the other day and put some highlights in it because I was desperate. I was, uh, you know, I had, when I go to the grocery store, <laughs> the kids go, oh, I love your <laughs> hair. And I go, well, it's COVID hair. But um, anyway, um, whatever, you know, it's, it's all about having fun and being entertaining mm -hmm. and, 
and uh and so, just camaraderie and, absolutely and so i'm i'm not even for sure when i'm coming up with the mighty blaze but I, I i know it's coming up sometime soon you don't have the schedule at all do you? no i'm not doing any of that anymore i'm just getting oh. authors for them so i don't really know the schedule oh. but oh, but oh, ping yeah. me and i'll oh. tell them i'll send you to trisha our our, yeah, our trisha i company. need to get with her and check on that again because what I, does your earring you say by the way queen oh, i love that. it <gasps> Where does they're she dry, they say queen and i wore oh them specifically gosh. for you and the tiara comes from uh pulp of queen yes, margie yes yeah, this is my this was my tiara for pulp but they do hurt your head like that crowns are better yeah, they, yeah i think the crown is better the tiara is really hard scars from all the years of wearing 20 years of wearing tiara and uh jeff for the, you're wondering what is this old woman have uh on her head <laughs> Basically, it was because I was forced as a child, uh, you know, when I was in high school to be in a, a Miss Eureka, Kansas beauty pageant. And, um, you know, I was twice as thin as I am now, but I, of course I thought I was, a, you know, toad, you know. So I had to walk down this courthouse walkway, you know, and as I'm walking down in my 1970s, you know, um, empire waist dress with my clunky shoes and <laughs> pant, panty, legs pantyhose uh they read off things about you you know that's what they do in pageants they say kathy is in this and she's that and and her oh. measurements are oh and they said it's 36 uh 34 36 and the judges all started laughing because oh. i was built straight up and down oh <laughs> I didn't have a waistline. And so um, they started laughing. <laughs> All I wanted to do was cry because I was so embarrassed. But I just, you know, I did like I'm doing now. I just smile and right. the big show. And I made it through. But I thought, who makes up this rule that um, you judge people by the way they look? It's how they it's are. It's terrible. Kids. It's terrible. It's yeah. ridiculous and terrible. It's also ironic that I made the living most of my life creating beauty and doing mm -hmm. hair. But I think it's because I always felt like I wasn't good enough, you know? So, uh, but now I realize that, I mean, most days, you guys, it's no makeup, a ball cap in my pajamas because I'm painting <laughs> it. So yeah, I, I like to dress up. I think it's a lot of fun. And when Diane Sawyer, when I was on Good Morning America, she said, can you have really big hair? Because I used to be in these pageants. And I said, you know, Diane, for you, I will. And uh, <laughs> it kind of became, that was our known thing, Texas big hair. And yeah, I'm there's a big from, hair ball, remember? <laughs> I'm not even from Texas. I'm from Kansas. But anyway, um, I think it's important to know that by being readers, we're beautiful within because we're educating and enlightening ourselves and reading great stories like yours. Mm -hmm. Thank and you. So, um, anyway, uh, I, you know, Dolly Parton's one of my favorite people because she's so misunderstood, but she will be remembered as probably the bi biggest liter literacy promoting person in the world because mm -hmm. she's given away over a, mil a million books to children. And I signed on right away to do that program in Jefferson. It's been going for 10 years. So, uh, and look where she is today. I mean, she's, she's, there's a brand new documentary on her that's just amazing. Oh amazing. my God, she is so amazing. She's literally, you just love her. You just smart. absolutely love her. She's very smart and I love the quote and all, I'm paraphrasing here, but she said, you know, somebody told her a dumb blonde joke and they said, what do you think about that? She goes, well, it doesn't bother me because first of all, I'm not really uh, blonde. You know? <laughs> I'm certainly not dumb. So that's what she, you she do, isn't dumb. She's very you know, smart. She's her own person. And I think we all have to be our own person. And I'm right. kind of a split personality. I, I like to get out and be in the dirt and paint outside and, you know, look for my forest finds, and then I like to glam it up for these yep. Zoom meetings. So, yeah, uh, it's my only excuse to get dressed up. I mean, otherwise, <laughs> I'm in my Walmart pajamas because I, you know, once they get enough paint on them, I throw them out and put on another pair. So, 
um, because I'm also an artist, Jeff. I, I went back to yes. college. In my this, this is, this is, this is Kathy's. Kathy designed yes. this t-shirt. And it's one of my favorite t-shirts. It's wow. really, it's made out of this, it's made out of this really great material, mylar, I think they call it, it where it's much softer than a regular t-shirt. And the colors are just gorgeous. And uh, is that my library, is that the one that was called my library? I think so. Um, yeah, I take I this, my I paintings. I take my alcohol ink paintings and I put them onto fabric, and that's what I have on today. This is one of my paintings. Oh, that's beautiful. Kimono with my Pulp Boy Queen t shirt. And um, it's been horrible for them because they're most of they hire women in third world countries to give them decent pay. They give 10% of their profits to literacy projects. And then when this COVID thing hit, it's been really hard to get their things from. Pakistan and India and different places that they're made, but they're creating jobs for women who, um, and, and decent pay. So I thought it was a wonderful company and uh, they're back shipping now. I know Carolyn had problems getting things and a few others. Yeah, but it I, came, it came. I mean, there's problems shipping everywhere now. So yeah, thank you for sharing your shirt. Because oh, I love this shirt. It's so comfortable, really. Isn't it great um, to wear art that you love? I mean, yes, you know yes, yes. I Any also want to give a whoops, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I just also wanted to give a shout out to Jeff Lyons, who has a storygeeks.com where he helps others with story structure if you want to help. What are you promoting me for? This is your, this <laughs> no, is no, your no. show. I, what is it again? So I can put it up on my uh, blog on this. Story what? Geeks. G E E K S dot com. You are so wonderful, Caroline. Thank you. <laughs> what I'm gonna do it's is a I'm really great. I'm telling you, he saves it. I don't start writing it until he okays my synopsis. And, and, and I don't, sometimes I don't it do takes six without months. her help either. So it's like mutual, believe me. <laughs> well, you know what? That's what friends are for, right? Right. Susan? right. We're We've been friends for a long time. Because if we try to do everything by ourselves, it's so lonely, you know, when you finally get yeah. there. There is no purpose in life um, unless you have something to look forward to or somebody to right. share it. And for me right, right now, you know, uh, when I, after Girlfriend Weekend, I got diagnosed with this diabetes thing. Um, I thought, I can't have it. I want to see my grandson grow up. You know, right. that's my right. whole hope. Right. So I almost took it very seriously and I got busy working on getting healthy and I feel great you guys I'm doing good but good. um I want to um invite you to definitely be one of my speakers uh for my online zoomathon yes Caroline. absolutely yes 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 and Jeff I hope you'll join maybe you'll join her maybe talk about the story geeks oh yeah want to do that of my pulp yes. queen I'd are love to. I'd love to. authors and or our authors that need that kind of help. So oh, yeah, we'd love to do that. Who are you on we're the panel? We're a tag team. We're a tag team. Okay, yeah. well, are you on Facebook where I can friend you? Uh, yes, yeah, just look for uh, Facebook slash Story Geeks. Okay, okay. And then I want you, Susan, to do a panel too. And, you know, we'll, we'll get together with that. And then, of course, I want you all to come when we meet again in 2022. And uh, so, how, uh, how do I get my tiara? You can wear a tiara. You can wear a lot of the guys wear gimme caps. You know, <laughs> that's their Texas brown, I guess. But uh, it was funny because when I first came out with this, I have a a a author guy friend that helped me start the Pulp of Queens of Linden, Texas. And he was lead guitarist for Linda Ronstadt and grew up with Don Henley of the Eagles. So I'm just like in awe of Richard. So he came one year and it was Richard Bowden and the Lago Rhythms and played at my girlfriend weekend. So the wonderful thing about um, having, you know, guys involved in this, we want to share what you do too because it's all about the friendships and the relationships we build through reading stories like Caroline's. So uh, Caroline, um, is there anything you want to end with that you want to share with everybody um, that's just kind of a, you know, 
an overall view of life in general, of what you've learned in your young years of being <laughs> not so young anymore. Um, yes, yes. First of all, never. It's it's always my thing. It's like just persist, follow your dreams, never ever give up. Um, Again, I don't care if you've had 80 rejections of one form or another, you never know what's going to happen next. Um, love can come to anybody at any time. My mom, who had an unhappy marriage, who hated men, fell in love for the first time when she was 95. Wow. And it, 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 There's it, hope for me yet! <laughs> <laughs> it was a wonderful, amazing experience. Um, just, you know, dare to dream and follow your dreams and don't listen to anybody telling you that you can't. Oh, and, you're such a and lady. And thank you. Here. Thank you so much, Kathy, for having me. And thank you so much, Susan, for being here. And thank you so much, Jeff, of course. And for anybody else watching this, watching this later. And if you have any burning questions that you didn't get on, oh, here, yes. please go to Carolyn's Facebook page. Is there any place else you would like to send them to ask you any questions? Uh, you can go to Twitter. I'm also on Twitter. It's at Levitt Novelist. You can ask me anything there. Um, I'm easy to find. <laughs> and you're going to be on our panels for- I can't our wait. That is going to be so much fun. Hopefully I'm going to make Jeff wear a tiara. <laughs> yeah, well, get a crown because they don't hurt your head like this here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. And thank all of you. Read, visit indie bookstores. That's right. And I will yeah. post this and send it to you so you can share. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you and so Jeff, much. Don't forget, uh, you know, we're going to get you oh, on the for that. <laughs> it's all about being inclusive and everybody getting on the same page together. Because right. I, I, I want to say that now even more than ever, because um, as we struggle to find our way in the days ahead, it's this relationship that makes our world. That's right. That's right. This was so much fun. Love you, Kathy. I love you. I love your house. I see the, all your wonderful things on the walls. See, and the, the, tram see the trampoline. <laughs> Here go. What's the trampoline for? It's like I needed something to exercise on that would be fun because I hate to exercise. And this, you can just blast music and jump on it for 20 minutes and it's a workout. So I just go for a walk in the woods with a big. Yeah, stick. well, if we had woods, I would do that. We do go for <laughs> walks. That's the best. Thank you all so, so much. Thank and you, guys. I, will, I will talk to you all soon. Bye. Okay. I will say goodbye and it'll be up soon. So everybody check it out. Thank you, Carolyn. Leave it. Thank, Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Jeff. Bye-bye. Uh -huh. Thank you.